Welcome to MedShark Insider with Bill Fukui, your expert host on all things medical marketing and SEO. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of MedShark Insider. Uh, I am absolutely uh, privileged today to have one of the uh, cosmetic industry's most um, uh, recognized and, and really the, one of the most credible uh, consultants that actually works with uh, practices that are both new as well as uh, more established practices, um, Sandy Roos. And she is the uh, president and owner of Practice Enhancement Specialists, which has been around for gee, almost about a decade now. Um, and, and she's worked with some of the most recognized practices and in many cases built practices up from the ground up. Uh, so I'm actually privileged to have her today and we're gonna be talking about uh, really kind of some of the pitfalls that these newer practices or practices that are uh, uh, surgeons that are wanting to start up a new practice. What are the common things that they can avoid uh, mistakes saving themselves not only a lot of time but quite frankly, a lot of money. So welcome today, Sandy. Hey, welcome. I'm so happy to be here. I just yeah. love everything so, that you're doing. This is amazing. You know, we we go back a, a, a long time and uh, and I think we met at one of the practice administrator courses. I think you yeah. were presenting either before or after me or something. Yeah. And I think that's where we kind of connected. I think uh, I listened to your talk and I'm like going, every marketer in the world should hire her <laughs> because, yes. man, they'll make you look so good <laughs> because, <laughs> because generating leads sometimes are the, is the easy part. It's what do you do to close them? So absolutely, uh, I think you were doing a course on, on, uh, on closing techniques or thing, right. handling the phone calls or follow up, something like that. And I thought you were, man, everything you talked about was so spot on. So I, I had to look you up, but we connected and, Correct. and uh, you know, it was, uh, it's been great. So one of the things we've recently started doing more of and even collaborating on are these uh, newer practices, these yeah. surgeons that are just uh, looking to start their own practice or who's been out for a very short period of time and is really in the early, early stages of of building that, you know, that dream practice. Um, right. So I'm going to ask you, number one, give a little background on you. Okay. And then I'm going to start in with kind of what, what should these guys start doing? So give a little background on yourself so our audience can learn a little bit more about you. Absolutely. Thank you again. I'm so excited to be able um, to do this with you. Like you said, I think both you and I have a, uh, a passion for, first of all, this plastic surgery industry. Uh -huh. um, and as well as like, really um, we've, I think both identified here over the last few years is that there's so many things that you and I can collaborate on um, to really help these younger guys. Just like you said, avoiding those pitfalls. So definitely thank you for having me. So just a quick background. Um, I've actually worked in medical um, since the mid eighties when I was going to college. Um, I didn't, I wasn't introduced to the plastic surgery or the cosmetic side of the plastic surgery until the late nineties. Um, and it kind of just fell into my lap. Uh, so I started working with a young doctor right out of his fellowship in a very busy Scottsdale, Arizona market. Um, and we grew his practice just based off of relationships. Um, and that was something that at the time, you know, websites were just becoming the thing. And so we really didn't have all of the technology that we have available to us today, but we grew pretty quickly. And so there was a medical device company, um, one of the breast implant companies reached out to me and asked me to come and work for them. And they were beginning um, starting a business development arm of their company. And so um, I went ahead and took the position, had to move to Florida, um, fell in love with everything that I was doing. Uh, was promoted. So I moved up to Connecticut, super excited about that. They were then acquired by a larger corporation. Um, eventually, um, one of my, well, my business partner and I, we ended up um, acquiring the division and went out on our own and started doing the consulting back in like uh, 2012, I believe. Um, and then fast forward a few years, um, Sientra <laughs> reached out um, and asked me to come and do that for them as well. And so up until just recently, I was actually the director of practice development with them, where I was able to, um, with my team, really work with um, plastic surgeons nationally, again, on just being great at 
the intake process and helping them if it was a new practice, you know, hiring, firing, setting up incentive plans, employee manuals, and then helping, you know, the more um, some practices that might've been out a little bit longer, you know, staff skills training. But our biggest thing is just really working with practices um, on really capturing the data that we know that's really gonna help them be better in their practice. Um, I most recently decided to um, part ways with Sientra. It was, um, they weren't happy about it, but it was this decision that had to be made, um, but they're still a great company. But so I'm just now back doing um, the consulting on my own and I'm gonna be partnering with a, a local plastic surgeon, um, surgeon here in Texas. And we're gonna be doing some really great things um, and continuing to do my workshops and um, doing more training and really, again, helping plastic surgeons. But our primary focus is gonna be on these younger plastic surgeons because uh -huh. I just really feel that there's such an opportunity there for us to give my years of wisdom <laughs> on what you can do wrong and what you can do right. And, okay. you know, the things that I did back in my practice back in the early 2000s, we made a lot of mistakes, but at the same time, we learned from them. But the things that we did then are, are totally different from what we make, um, what we suggest to our practices now. So mm -hmm. we keep up on the times. Um, you know, Sandy, you know, you mentioned kind of, and I love the fact that you, you kind of addressed the uh, really the younger surgeons where, and that's where the growth in this industry is. The industry right. is, is, is filled with entrepreneurial types of, uh, of surgeons wanting to go out on their own, that kind of stuff. But as you kind of mentioned, there's all these different things that you can be helping them with. Um, what do you see different? I mean, you, you, you've been in this industry, we've both been in this industry for 20 plus years. What do you see different in these young surgeons today that you're consulting and, and helping them with their practice? What do you see different in these young surgeons today as compared to say 15 years ago when, you know, when, when it was a much different environment? What do you see different? Well, I feel there's quite a few things. Um, I really want to focus a little bit more on this, the physician wanting to go out on their own versus the physician that is wanting to join a practice. Um, and I think, you know, really, you can probably separate the two of those um, types of young plastic surgeons, right. and I would have totally different recommendations. So I really think today, I hope we'll just focus on the ones that are just really wanting to go out on their own um, and just starting yeah. their business. Um, I think what's changed is that they have their... They really understand the need for doing it right the first time. Right. Um, and that's even from five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really seeing that they will invest um, the time and the resources. Sometimes that's, you know, uh, money into right. making sure that they are getting out and, you know, within that first year or two, being able to be relevant in their market. Mm -hmm. and, and in the old days, I, I'm an old timer, I always say, mm -hmm. but in the old days, there was this, you know, this um, idea that a young plastic surgeon had to go serve their time in the ER, they had to go do call, they had to go do reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, not the case anymore. Um, you know, a lot of these younger guys that I have the opportunity to be able to talk with, it's the ones that really have that entrepreneurial um, spirit about them. Um, mm -hmm. And they recognize very early on, I need to do it right the first time. Okay. Um, and so I, to me, that's one of the biggest differences right now mm -hmm. um, that I've seen, like I said, even over the last five years. Huh. You know, the other thing too, was um, this, this topic of, of addressing pitfalls uh, and, and building a practice, you know, from the ground up, that type of stuff, that covers a lot of ground. I mean, we chatted very briefly at the very beginning about all these, you know, things that you do for these practices. I'm going to limit our, our talk today pretty much on the operational side stuff, because we can get into social media and all this, and man, we will be here all day, to be honest with okay. you. Um, so I really want to focus in on those handful of pitfalls or the primary money time-saving things that you can help practices avoid uh, in terms of an operations, personnel, that type of stuff. So what would you say from that perspective would be the, say the most important things, where do they start? Where do they, where do they begin? Sandy, uh, I'm a new surgeon, I wanna start, where do I start? Absolutely. That's such a, 
uh, easy, difficult question <laughs> to answer. <laughs> easy, difficult. I like that. It's an easy, difficult question. Um, I'll try to keep things as short as possible. Yeah. You'll know when to interrupt me. Um, but obviously, you know, hiring, staffing, um, and compensation. Okay. And I know we, we we're going to avoid the marketing talk right now, but you know that is something as well. The you know there was those are really the top four things that I see where practices. Um, when I say they they make mistakes, it's because sometimes I will start you know be introduced to a practice at year three or year four, mm -hmm. and even though they've been out you know three years or four years, we're having to go back to the beginning because yeah. that's where they pretty much haven't made the correct decisions. Right. Um, so, you know, that's where to me, it's, if those are the things you really need to focus on initially. Um, and again, we can talk about marking, I think, like you said, and maybe our, our second part of this series, um, because that's a big one where people make mistakes though. Yeah. Um, but definitely hiring, um, who to hire, you know, what roles do you hire? Where do we find them? And then obviously like the compensation and then the, the processes, um, I'm a big process oriented person. I believe in tracking. I believe that you track correctly at the beginning and that way it becomes a habit. So you're not introducing it at three years where people get really mm -hmm. defensive and like, why do they care? Yeah. You know? So <laughs> it's something I like to start the whole processes at the beginning as well. Right. Okay. Well, let, let's start with hiring kind of that. Yeah. I mean, if that's kind of, I mean, like anything else, a, a practice is only going to be as, as productive, as effective and really develop the relationships with patients as good a surgeon as you have. It starts with people. Um, where do you start with that with a, a surgeon? Yeah. So initially it, depending of course, on what your five-year goal is. Um, I always say, you know, if you, if you build your practice at the start off of the first two or three years, that's when at the four or five year mark, when people are looking like, mm -hmm. Hey, you know, I'm wanting to get to that next level and I'm just not getting there. Right. So I always want to say, start at the five year, start with your five year plan. And that's where you need to hire. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great biggest pitfalls that people um, have done in the past, and I, I feel like they're not doing it as much right now, but I'm still seeing it is the first person they hire is a seasoned practice manager that knows how to do billing, meaning like right. insurance billing. And that's great. Um, but they are not going to be the one that's going to grow that cosmetic side of the practice. And so, again, that's the other thing we have to look at. I always say, you know, people have this misconception that I only work with people that do cosmetic. Right. Um, and that's, you know, it, it might appear that way because that's really where we focus. And, you know, for physicians that really are going to be 100 percent insurance their entire career, I'm probably not the best person for them to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's, you know, a practice that knows that, you know, again, a five year plan, at year five, I only want to be doing maybe 30% reconstruction right. or maybe 20%. Right. And I think that's true with most practices. Most of the practices don't want to get it, you know, completely gone. Correct. Uh, in fact, they can't really do yeah. it a hundred percent, but you know, I think that's probably, I think that that would be a, a, a relatively uh, ambitious goal for a lot of surgeons. Correct. I agree. Um, and so typically what I also see is that for the first five years, the physician truly is very involved in the day-to-day -day running of the practice. Mm -hmm. So do you really need that office manager? Do you need that practice administrator that's been doing it 20 years and let's bring them in and they're just going to build my practice like for that doctor they just worked with. And I honestly don't feel that's the, the best person to hire at first. Okay. Okay. Um, again, it's because to me, if you find a really great patient care coordinator that had worked in a different practice. Um, or even a very strong front office coordinator that, you know, her next role or up the ladder as far as building her career would be a patient care coordinator. I feel that's a really strong first hire because mm -hmm. you need to have somebody that knows the inner workings of a clinic day, of talking right. to the patient, um, signing consents, you know, mm -hmm. the financing portion of it, all of that. And that is the person that you're going to actually have more success with and be able to grow more quickly if you have that key person in your practice versus you know, an office manager, a seasoned office manager, they have the experience, but they're not going to office managers typically aren't really great patient care coordinators. Yeah. And so since you as a physician typically will still be doing the bookkeeping and paying the bills and cause you need to keep a close eye on that your first you know, few years in practice, I, I don't think you need that office manager person per se initially. I, 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 you know, that's surprising. I, I mean, I think most 
most uh, practices would think that would be the first hire is, is yeah. who's, who's going to hire, you know, who can I hire to run this business? Correct. You know, and, and really, I think they got to get their feet a little wet themselves. Uh, like you said, in the first couple of years, they are the ones, you know, they, they, they get acclimated, you know, mm -hmm. acclimation under fire kind of thing. Um, about running a business, which they've never been trained to do, you know, academically. Um, but, but, you know, most of these guys are, let's face it, they were the smartest guys in class or gals in class. Um, they, they pick it up. They pick it up pretty quickly. Well, um, and I think for me, like when I started with my doctor, I said he was right out of his fellowship. And I always like to tease him that he, he got really lucky <laughs> because <laughs> I had manager experience I knew how to do the billing component as well because I was a billing manager back in the 90s for a 50 physician multi-specialty group. Right. But then I also knew the cosmetic side of it. And so, you know, for us, you know, as we were trying to build out our own office, we were sharing space. You know, his office was a closet. You know, mine, I had the bigger space because, you know, I was the one that was making money and I was the one talking to him and selling the surgery, even though he was doing the surgery, I needed more room. And so, um, it really, it, it helped us, you know, really grow knowing that I was able to do pretty much everything, uh -huh. um, right at the beginning. So again, you can have a patient care coordinator that's acting as an office manager, um, because, you yeah. know, but again, that person has to have experience initially, you right. know, as you grow your practice, that's where I say, if you have an office manager that's been there a while, and as you're growing, there's nothing wrong with hiring a patient care coordinator that's never had plastic surgery experience. Actually, mm -hmm. that's my favorite person to hire. But initially, that you your patient care coordinator needs to be the most experienced person yeah. um, in a plastic surgeon's you office. You know, I think the other part of that too is the dynamics of building a practice. You have more of that rapport, that mm -hmm. instant connection with that patient, you know, the PCC, yeah. more than say an office manager who's kind of off doing their own thing, trying to, you know, but yeah. you are there on the firing line Absolutely. with the PCC, you're in consult, you're, you know, yeah. you're actually developing more of that, uh, I think a camaraderie, a, a chemistry, kind mm -hmm. of a culture, I think. Absolutely. And uh, they actually, start... in most practices will make more than the office manager as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. You know, and so unless you're a big, big practice, that's not the case, but you know, for starting out that you'll probably pay them more than you would your patient care coordinator. I mean, than uh, you would your office manager. Right. Um, you know, and, and that, you know, now you're getting into a whole nother topic about compensation. Correct. Um, uh, and that's always a, a big question for uh, the surgeons that are trying to start their business on their own. How do I put together a plan and, and fill in the, the blanks when it comes to compensation? What, what should I be planning on, on spending for these different positions? How do you address, you know, compensation with, with the surgeons? Yeah. And that's something that, again, that we get, um, I've had practices, they call me doctors all the time. What should I pay my patient coordinator? What should I pay my nurse injector? What should I pay? Everybody's what should I pay? What should I pay? Um, and it truly I always say, you know, it, it's based off of one experience, where you are in the country, and what is your budget? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the surgeons that I, I work with very closely, and that we've done a great job in growing his business, you know, since I started working with him as a consultant in 20, um, late 2014, one of the things he said early on, and I, I love this about him, is that he said, you got to pay your people. You need to pay them and pay them well. Um, but it doesn't always have to be in base. And, you know, it's a bonus structure. It's an incentive okay. plan. And I'm big yeah. on incentive plans. Okay. Um, and so it's one of the things that I know doctors would love to have just like me to be able to send this, you know, standard email that with all of their answers on compensation, but that's a discussion that, you know, it's a different discussion with each physician I work with. Okay. Um, and okay. so it's, you know, it's, but again, it's always a base based and then like an incentive plan. Now, again, incentive plans, you know, cause you've been on tons of my webinars <laughs> is that I don't believe it should be a percent of the business. And I can tell you on a different conversation or a different webinar, why, because that's a whole discussion, but that doesn't incentivize them to grow. It's, you know, it's, it truly is, you're going to set a number goal that this is what we want to get this month. And once you hit that, you get a X dollar amount. Um, I can tell you again, I've had a physician that early on before I started working with them, they couldn't afford the coordinator. And so they paid her a lesser salary. 
and then said, but we're going to give you X percent of everything that you bring in and oh, all the yeah. you know sales. And that sounded great at the beginning. That patient coordinator was making one hundred and ninety five thousand yeah. dollars, you know, at one point. And I'm like, OK, that, that's a little high. And it's only going up from there. <laughs> exactly. And I can tell you, yeah, the doctor was growing, but he, he it was just it didn't make sense. And so it's very hard to take somebody that's making that much money and then change their whole comp plan to make yeah. less. And so, no, you know, and, and I always I'll tell you what, they, they don't stay after that. They feel no. you just, you know, you change the rules on me. Correct. You know, so it, it is something that, you know, again, if you set them up correctly and don't do the percent and I'm telling you, I'm seeing that everywhere right now. Oh, I you? have, you know, consultants out there and, you know, telling doctors, just give them a percent. I don't know who has given people that idea, but I have a lot of doctors right now reaching out. Um, right to me and saying, they, Hey, my coordinator is wanting, they sh- and they're showing us like what they're seeing that's out there. Wow. Um, okay. So it's, you know, setting it up correctly at the beginning makes sense. Okay. How do you address that with the surgeon then when, when they're saying, Oh my, you know, this gal that I'm, I mean, she's going to be great. She's going to be a great PCC. Um, but she's wanting an incentive plan that's, that's based on a percentage. How do you address that with the surgeon to say, you know, that you, that, that really doesn't make sense. Um, it actually, it's a pretty easy discussion. It's years ago, you know, part of being a part of the um, ASPS or ASAP, uh-huh. I forget which one is, there's nothing, you can't do fee splitting. Oh, okay. Um, and I can tell you back in, you know, the early 2000s when I was working with a different company and um, one of the gentlemen there, um, he had actually said that if you give somebody a percent of like if the quote's 10,000 and you give them 1%, I completely made that number up. Mm-hmm. Even if it's off the surgeon's fee, um, that's, you're splitting their, your fee with them. Your fee with them. And so, you know, at, depending on who the president of the society was, would always depend on if they would consider that fee splitting. Fee splitting. But that's, okay. you know, I just consider that fee splitting. Okay. Um, as well as it truly doesn't incentivize growth. And, mm-hmm. you know, we really do like to, you know, look at a number and say this month, and we only bonus off a surgeon's fee. Um, we don't bonus off of OR anesthesia. It's not the total quote. It's just the okay. surgeon's fee. And it's right, when right. the surgery is performed, not when the money's collected. Um, and uh, so it's a pretty okay. you know, good plan. And then we also like to have a proficiency part of our compensation um, plan. And that's where, you know, you have a financial goal and you have like whatever behavior we're trying to change or make better in the practice, whether it's a conversion rate, a no-show rate, a same okay. day conversion rate, we'll we'll make that as a second component of that compensation plan Okay. Um, to really, so we can split it up a little bit. Okay. So, you know, now that we're talking about even kind of maybe taking it to the next step uh, in terms of how we're going to be compensating them uh, now, now it boils down to data. You got to mm-hmm. have the data. How right. are you going to be compensating them if you don't have the data to, to, to show um, right. that, you know, both to both the PCC, your office administrator, or whoever you're incentivizing, uh, as well as the surgeon. Um, How do you go about, because I I know for a fact, most of my practices, when I first start working with them, they don't even track phone calls, or they don't track anything, they track very little, you know, so where, where do you work with, or how do you work with a surgeon to that, that this isn't part of their regimen, um, that, that they become more acclimated to, you know, basing decisions more on data and not just their gut feeling or their wife or their spouse or, you know, their, their other significant other, um, that they're, they're making decisions based on data, not, not emotion. Well, and you, you know me, I'm, I'm a data person. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can tell you when I start working with practices that are more established, one mm-hmm. of the most difficult parts of the process and really engaging with them is getting data from them. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of the EMR systems, they, they have reporting, but none of them have the, you know, really accurate reporting when it comes to, like you were saying, everything from the initial lead, whether it's a contact me, a direct message from Instagram um, or a chat lead versus a phone call lead. Most people start tracking at console. Um, oh, okay. and, it, and it's, so it, it's, you know, it, that's why I like, to start working with these younger physicians, because I'm, we have spreadsheets that if, you know, to show them that let's, let's start tracking different, you know, patients at different um, steps of the decision-making 
process. Mm -hmm. um, really looking at the spreadsheet, comparing it then to the software that they might have. If it's, you know, if the manual works and it, it equals or is the same as the EMR data, then I'm saying you don't have to do things manually. But I have this amazing spreadsheet that I put together that practices that have, you know, Next Tech, they have Patient Now, they have all these my other software applications. Right. They love it because it truly allows them to track, you know, different from the initial lead at consult, as well as then really the surgeon's fee um, and like helping them know where they are towards their bonus. Okay. Um, and so that's one of the things I really like to work with these younger surgeons about is because I want them to make decisions based off of data. Right. You know, uh, and, and that's I think, how I think you're right on. They, yeah. the, the, the biggest mistake is they don't track data. They, they don't. That. And they really, and they make assumptions to your point, but the joke is, is that, and I just, when I was at Sientra, I was taught, you know, training my new team. And I said, every physician you go to is going to tell them you have, there's going to tell you they have an 80% conversion rate. And it was very interesting to see how they got, as they started talking with physicians, they would come back and like, oh my gosh, they said they had an 80% conversion rate. And I said, then I know. And I said, everybody does it. And so I'm like, well, let's just start tracking. Let's just do it for two months or let's pull your data, you know, from, you know, the, the schedule, not from the EMR, but from the schedule, yeah. let's look to see how many consults you had in May or June and July and how many of them have booked. And the majority of the time they're anywhere between a 25% to a 48% conversion rate. Okay. And they think they're at 80. Um, yeah. Every once in a while, I'll see a, you know, a 50% conversion rate, but nowhere near 80%. The reality. Uh, <laughs> nowhere near reality. It, absolutely. And so, you know, that's why I'm like, let's make decisions based off of data. I always say, even when I start working with practices, you know, it, one of the biggest um, obstacles and hurdles we have is really working with the office manager and the coordinator, because once they start seeing the things that we're trying to track and they see where their conversion rates are mm -hmm. is when they get, you know, kind of defensive. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's where I always tell the physician, if you start tracking at the beginning, you're never going to have that problem. Mm -hmm. um, as well as if you ever have an office manager or patient coordinator, tell them that you don't need to track you really don't want them working with you, um, okay. at least not in that type of position, because there's no way when I was a patient care coordinator, I, everything I did was based off of data um, and I tracked it. And I could tell you, I thought for sure I had a much higher conversion rate <laughs> until right. I started tracking it. And then I was like, wow. But I always knew then if things were, you know, if I saw my conversion rate going down, I'm like, why, what, what do I need to do different? The doctor wasn't going to get mad at me because of it. But it's, it was like an opportunity for me to like take a step back. What, what have I forgotten to do and the things that you might, I normally do? Or do I need to do something different now? Uh -huh. um, and so it truly, you know, I made, again, you've seen my workshops are every decision that I made in the practice was based off of we wanted to have, you know, 50 to 55 percent of our people schedule surgery the day of consult. And when I saw that number decrease, I'm always like, OK, why aren't they booking at consult? And then, so, you know, I, we came up with those reasons over the years and doing workshops, you know, financing is a big one. People aren't ready to, you know, price. Um, another one is they weren't ready because they didn't know preoperative or postoperatively what the, you know, what their limitations would be. Mm -hmm. So where can we pre-consult take care of that? And so to me, that's where really working with the practice and, and developing good habits at the beginning is going to really save them a lot of heartache, heartache in like two or three years. So again, I always try to, even though like you and I know, I like to collect data, I have to approach it differently because as soon as you start asking people to collect data, they get defensive. Yeah. It almost becomes, you know, it's got to be something that's ingrained from the get-go correct, and that they've embraced it correct. and they're, they're, they're no longer feeling, I think salespeople in general, you know, I can say yeah. that because I've been in sales my whole, pretty much my whole professional <laughs> career. Salespeople in general are mavericks. They don't want to be held accountable, you know, in, in no. many cases. Um, and when you're- Only if it's a good number. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Only if they know it's a good number. Uh, <laughs> but but in general, it is, they, they want to, you know, they, they generally are somewhat secretive about that simply because they don't want to be accountable. I think when you develop a culture of, uh, of transparency and, and, and it's not a, a personal uh, attack on you. If even, even if you're not hitting those, those numbers or even if you're at the 25%, you know, on right. conversions, 
Um, it, it's about what can we do to get make it better? Uh, and, and instilling that type of culture as opposed to one that that's more defensive. Yeah. But I think that happens, like you said, you got to start building that culture from the beginning. Absolutely. And one, you know, we, we started talking initially about like who to hire. And I think what you just, you know, you kind of mentioned it a few minutes ago is like, who do we compensate? And one of the things you said, was like, is it the office manager? Is it the front office coordinator? And so I want to kind of backpedal a little bit um, to when we talk about who they should hire first, mm-hmm. because one thing you and I, we, that I didn't, I forgot to mention is that after the um, patient care coordinator, really the second person they should hire should be a really great front office coordinator. Oh, okay. Um, and one of the, one of the things that people will do is they'll say, well, I only need them there when I'm in the office. So with the doctors in surgery, they just, okay. You know, the front office coordinator is not there. And that's what, again, one of the biggest mistakes people make. Again, you have a patient care coordinator, a front office coordinator. You still don't have that office manager yet, Mm -hmm. Um, but your front office coordinator is going to be able to answer the phone and do other tasks. So your patient care coordinator can make sure that she's talking to your patients, doing all the follow-up, you know, doing all of the busy work that she needs to do when you're in surgery. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of practices, doctors will say, well, I'm in surgery. I don't need that front office coordinator. But now that patient care coordinator is having to answer all the phones and do all of that. So I just wanted to back up a little bit on that just to make sure, because again, that's one of the biggest pitfalls that I see where doctors do in the hiring process is hiring, um, not hiring a full-time front office coordinator as their second hire. Interesting. I mean, I, that would have never occurred to me. Yeah. I would have. And I, I, I think it's pretty common where the doctor's not in the office, uh, for them, it's out of sight, out of mind. Correct. Kind of thing. And, and things just happen all, you know, almost magically on its own. Uh, But we all know that it doesn't. Absolutely. Uh, So where do you, you know, a a good question would be, where do you find these people? Where do you find, um, you know, a a PCC or a front office coordinator? Uh, Where do you find people with those types of skill sets? Uh, Because I don't think they're, they're really, you know, uh, promote. I, I, I wouldn't think that I would get a lot of that off of LinkedIn you know, no. personally. Um, well, you'd be surprised. Um, not the front office coordinator, but the patient care coordinator. If again, I feel you need to have an established patient care coordinator or mm-hmm. somebody that's been a really good front office coordinator in a very busy practice that, you know, wants to move into a PCC role, but there's not the opportunity in their current practice. Okay. Um, and so, you know, that would be my, if you can't, but on LinkedIn, you can like do a search for like patient care coordinator. I'm seeing okay. more and more people having that because it is a career. I mean, you can make okay. really good money at it. Okay. Um, but obviously we still go back to indeed um, because that seems to be the one to me, you get, you know, 1% of, you know, you can get, have 200 applications and two of them will be patient care coordinators. Right. Um, but it, it truly is, is just like putting the word out amongst your reps, like okay. who do you feel would be a good person. Um, but again, you have to have an experienced one for front office coordinator. If you have that experienced patient care coordinator, I love finding my own. I like going to a restaurant. I like going to a high end <laughs> store pre COVID uh-huh. and really watching people. Because to me, I want somebody that's nice. I can't train nice, okay. but I can train them on everything else they need to do. Okay. But you can't train a per you can't teach somebody how to be nice right. and how to, you know, have that great customer service. Um, I was most recently on vacation and I was in Fort Lauderdale and the person when we checked into the hotel was absolutely amazing. And I was like, Oh, I need to hire her. I need to get her <laughs> to practice here in Fort Lauderdale because she was that great on day three. When I went down by the front desk, that person wasn't as great, but you know, right. I've, I've seen it, you know, where I, I was again, many years ago in Washington, DC with the practice meeting with the doctor and we were having dinner and the back server, they have two servers for each table because uh-huh. it was a nicer restaurant. She was amazing. And I mean, I, I just kept watching her throughout tonight, how she interacted with, you know, the different people, how she was just nice. You just, you just wanted to be around her. And so right. at the end of the night, I went up to her and I said, I know this sounds really strange, but Hey, you know, what do you do during the day? You know? And she's like, <laughs> well, actually, I just moved here from long Island And this is, you know, this is what I do full time. And I said, well, I have a practice that might be looking for a front office coordinator, you know, as a plastic surgeon's office, you have an amazing personality. Would you be interested in applying? I'm not offering her the job. Right. And by the way, I didn't have an opening anywhere in any of my practices in that area. 
But I did go to the doctor that I was working with and I said, you have to hire this girl. Yeah, she is absolutely amazing. And he ended up hiring her. And she she lasted a few years until she moved back to New York. Um, But that's what I like to do. I like to go and find people um, and Mm -hmm. see I get to see how they interact with people, because in an interview, they're putting on their best front. Yeah, they're they're outgoing. They're going to tell you everything you need to hear. Right. Um, And so for me, a front office coordinator, I feel you need to be a little bit, you know, different in how you do that and be a little creative. Mm -hmm. Um, The person that um, replaced me when I left my job um, in Arizona, I went to the mall to in Scottsdale and she was at, I saw her at the NARS counter in Neiman Marcus. And I just loved how she talked to everybody. She treated everybody the same. And I'm like, Oh, that's it. And so she ended up taking my position um, because she just was so good with people. You know, I think that, I think they, uh, again, I think you can, you can, t- you can teach aptitude. You can't yeah. teach attitude sometimes. Correct. Um, and, you know, I'm, we're actually in the middle of doing some sales training uh, where it is about, do you, do they have the technical skills? Do they have the, you know, product knowledge? Uh, is it behavior? You know, what, what, what all precedes itself. And I still gravitate back towards it. it, it it's still attitude. You can do yeah. behaviors that help change your attitude, but it's still, I still believe it, it starts with attitude. Um, it does. And because without attitude, even the behaviors, you can't persevere. You can't Correct. persevere with behavior that may not be getting the results. If they get results right away, like you said, uh, yeah. they get right, results right away, then great, it changes my attitude. But mm-hmm. it's the attitude that helps you get through those tough times. Absolutely. You know, the down times that doesn't change your behavior because mm-hmm. your attitude and determination, those types of things stick with you. Um, yes. And then you're, it'll, it'll maintain your behavior so you can get through those tough times and you'll right. still do the activities needed to yeah. get the results. Yeah. Um, but but it, sometimes it, it takes that personality sometimes mm-hmm. uh well and i you know i think you know you what you said there as well as earlier is that it's hard when just bringing somebody on and you have to create um habits yeah and so to me when you're bringing on whatever position it is um you want to make sure because like i always say bringing on a new front office person you get to teach her she's not bringing bad habits with her mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. And that's the only downfall I can say to an to a patient care coordinator and established one, and that's is when they come in, they're they're going to have experience that you need, but you really need to make sure that they have experience, but they also are open to doing things different. Right. And I think that's key. You know, you and I laughed kind of about it. I'm always making fun of my age, um, but again, I, I told you this story. I was talking to one of my favorite surgeons ever, and he were looking for a new location for it to open up, you know, he's opening up his fourth. And he's like, well, I found this one and it's right next to an Ulta. It's in a really nice area. And I'm thinking, I'm like, well, okay, but gosh, you know how, you know, you got to think of people, are they going to feel comfortable walking into a plastic surgeon's office where everybody can and see you going in, yeah. you know, and, and he and I have a great working relationship. He's like, yeah, but that's your age. You guys worry <laughs> about that. And I'm like, wait a minute. Hey, but he was that. correct. He said his target market is not my age I'm in that area. And so, and I, he, that's one of the things he always says he loves working with me because I'm always open. I never, I never feel like just because I did it a certain way, doesn't mean that it's the way you need to do it. And so I think that when you're hiring somebody, you have to find no matter what position, the person that is going to be open to new ideas and not be like, it's my way or no way. You know, I've been doing this for 10 years. How dare you question me? Because these younger surgeons are marketing a lot different than the surgeons that have been around 20 years. So I think that's really key. Um, as you're looking for somebody and that's why it's, and again, I'm not going to, I'm going to toot my own horn here, horn here. I like working with these younger surgeons because if they have, you know, a lot of times I'm involved in the initial hiring and helping them hire. And now that person has, you know, formed a relationship with me. So I'm able to right away, start putting in spreadsheets and start Mm -hmm. really putting in these things that I know is going to make a difference. And it kind Mm -hmm. of helps the doctor not have to deal with that. But again, we're starting it out the correct way. 
Right. Um, and it's even something I talk about when I'm talking to the if a possible patient care coordinator is you have so much experience. I want you to kind of forget a lot of it when you walk in the door, mm-hmm. you know, we're right. going to do things a little bit differently, but your experience is going to help that, but you can't, you can't, you have to be able to want to do things differently or you're not going to help this doctor grow. Right. I think, uh, I think that's, that's number one, it's transparent. It's, it's being right. clear uh, about expectations, about, mm-hmm. you know, a mindset when you come into a job and that, uh, you know, no, nobody's bigger than the practice. Correct. Nobody is bigger than the practice. Correct. Okay, at the end of the day, uh, yep. we're all doing things and I'm, you know, I started working with Med, uh, MedShark Digital uh, fairly recently. We founded MedShark fairly recently. Uh, and a lot of the things that we do are very different than what I, you know, for the last 20 years had did, you know, in my previous agency. Yeah. Um, very, very different. Uh, not that it's it's better or worse. It's just, it's different. Um, yeah. And I do think that there's a reason why we're doing it that, that way once I understand it. Um, now all of a sudden, ah, the light turns on. I get it. I get why you're doing this makes a lot of sense. Okay. Uh, but I think if you go in with the baggage and that it's my way or the highway kind of thing, um, you, you limit opportunity, you limit growth. No question. Absolutely. Do you do, do you do much in the way? So, so if I'm, you, you talked about location, um, what do you, what kind of advice or how do you go about helping a surgeon when, when they're talking about location, because that is one of the first things that they look at. Everybody says location, location, location. Right. What do you, you know, how do you apply that in today's environment in terms of location for a, a plastic surgery office? I think there's two different things. There's location is they're in school. They're like, I don't know where I'm going to go practice. Like where, where am I, what state am I going into? Mm-hmm. Um, I see that a little bit more, but what I am seeing, they always say I'm open to go anywhere, but boy, I'd sure love to be in Texas or, oh, I'd sure (laughs) love to be in Florida. I always say, and as I'm helping some practices add, you know, bring on physicians, one of the things we look at is what, what do you have here? Why would you want to be here? Because we know if they don't have family here, or if they don't have some history here, that the chances of them leaving are pretty, pretty high after like- Is it really? Yeah. yeah. And so okay. I am seeing a lot of the, these younger surgeons within the first five years moving around. And I hadn't seen that in the past. Okay. Um, and so we, for us, when we're hiring on a new physician, we always want to like, what, what's going to keep you here. But okay. then the second one again is really once they get like, Hey, this is where I'm going to go on my own. I'm going to go, you know, open in um, Las Vegas, mm-hmm. which I don't ever recommend, but I'm going to, <laughs> open in Las Vegas. You used to live there. I know. I did used to live there. And that was the most difficult market for plastic surgeons to hire really great people. Um, But Las Vegas is, you know, there's different areas there, Summerlin, Henderson, you know, those areas and that, but it's really like, again, where do you want to be in five years? To me, you know, one of the great things that I like is, and again, I I believe that doctors should own their own buildings, but Mm -hmm. that's pretty lofty goal at the beginning is to go lease a space build your practice, make sure that's where you want to be mm-hmm. and then go and build <laughs> your own space, hopefully with an OR. Right. Um, I mean, I really, but I I've seen doctors that have went out right away, spent all this money on a build out or whatever. And one, they outgrew it pretty quickly or two, it was a really bad location. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I kind of like the model of just finding somewhere to lease, Okay. Um, you know, and build your business. So you're not, you don't have all this overhead. Um, and then, like I said, just after you build it, then go ahead and like, okay, now I'm ready to buy. Um, I do think doctors should have their own OR. Um, and again, it's, it's a pretty, it's one of the most expensive things that you can do in building your practice. So to me, again, a five-year goal, Okay. Uh, you know, so so it's, so, so you're, you're pretty much, you know, laying the groundwork fairly early, uh, in the planning process, Mm -hmm. you know, we have goals. The, The goal would be once we open our doors, you know, in five years, that would be the goal. Because that right. was one of the questions is that I was going to ask is some of the most successful practices I've seen that have gone out on their own did exactly what you just said. They have their own OR. They're yeah. not reliant a hundred percent on uh, privileges at different hospitals mm-hmm. or, or whatnot. 
and I think there's a credibility when it comes to cosmetic patients. Yeah, uh, when a facility has its own, you know, ASC mm -hmm. uh, and and their own staff and their, right. you know, and their people. Uh, I think there is a uh, a cohesiveness uh, that gets communicated to patients. Mm -hmm. You know, when when the doctor's in control, the surgeon's in control right. of not only just what they're doing, but the environment around them. Yeah. Well, and again, it, it's something that, you know, even through 2020 doctors that had their own surgical center were able to go back and do surgery much more quickly. Oh, uh, they'd already, point. they've already de um, developed relationships with anesthesiologists when right. a lot of the state started reopening for, you know, um, cash pay, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, um, cosmetic procedures, right. the, uh, the ASCs and that the first responsibility was, is doing all of the, anything that wasn't cosmetic. It wasn't right. a breast dog, you know, it was hernia repair. It was, uh -huh. you know, the different procedures and anesthesia was like doubling their cost at that time. Oh, really? In a yeah. lot of the areas. And so doctors that had their own ORs pretty much were able to seamlessly go back because they already had those relationships. Like right. You right. know, so, and, and again, it's just, it's a nice place to be. Uh -huh. um, you can control your, the days you have. Um, uh -huh. and then again, I think there's a whole nother series on, you know, when do you bring on a new physician? You know, what do you, uh, do you have that, you know, the point. OR should be separate from the practice, but right attached to it. If you have another name, could you then, you know, on the days you're not operating, let somebody else use it, you know, but it's also nice when you're ready to bring on a new physician, um, that you have that OR. So then it would be full five days a week versus just maybe three days a week. Right. right. Um, there's just a lot of, you know, things to consider, but again, I think it would be very short sighted of a short sighted of a physician to write out the gate and say, no, I'll never going to have my own OR. Um, but I also think it's a lot, it's to do it at, right at the, unless you have family money to mm -hmm. go out and start your own practice and open your own right. OR the same time. That's, that's pretty lofty goal. I've seen lofty it done. Goal when they've had family money, but right. it's, it's a tough one other than that. Okay. Well, as long as you plan for it and, yeah. and budget for it, et cetera, I think it, you know, and again, just stay the course, you got to have somebody to kind of coach you to, right. to stick, yeah. stick to those things. Um, I, I think there's no reason why you, you can't, you know, have those things. Right. Um, because I think the market is there, the market mm -hmm. for what we do it's there. There's no reason why a practice there is my, you know, my surgeons are having their best year. And some of my younger surgeons, you know, they've been out four years, um, five years. And I'm like, okay, when are you going to bring on your next associate? Yeah. You know, and they're like, what? I'm like, you, you have patients calling in that are going somewhere else because you can't get them in for surgery until June. Yeah. You know, and they're like, well, wait, wait a minute. And then I have other <laughs> positions like I'm ready to bring on a new associate. And I'm like, no, you're not ready yet. Yeah. You don't need, you don't have enough leads, yeah. you know? And so, but I, I'm seeing more and more of these younger people um, that, you know, in years past, we never would have thought of ever needing to bring on a new associate without, you know, under 10 years. Right. And I see, I'm seeing a few more of them now that you right. know, you know, the five and six year mark that probably could bring on an associate and really do yeah. well with I, it. You know what? And I think you're right. The environment's changed. The Correct. environment has changed where that can happen today. And I, mm -hmm. I think with entrepreneurial and, and business minded uh, planning, uh, yeah. making sure you avoid the pitfalls and Correct. don't have to take steps backwards all the time, uh, you can build enough momentum where that you know, that four or five year, uh, where they are having ASCs or bringing on an associate, mm -hmm. it, it's absolutely the market, absolutely. you know, it, in the midst of a pandemic, I'm hearing practices have their best year ever. Oh, I mean, they've, everybody crazy, has. crazy. Yeah. And um, in 2021, it's the same. Mm -hmm. um, well, because doctors didn't go on vacation, yeah. patients didn't go on vacation. So they had extra money to spend. They didn't have to uh, worry about, you know, picking up Johnny from soccer because there was no soccer. Well, and, and <laughs> years ago, we had to wait for those tax return dollars coming Correct. in. Now they've accumulated enough money that they yeah. don't need the tax return money to yeah, pay for stuff because they, they saved it. They yeah. banked it. One of the yeah. things I think, I don't know how much more time we have, but it kind of goes with this is if we're talking and I think it would be, I think we need to, you and I need to talk about it just briefly. It's like, you know, naming the practice. Um, yeah. Because, you know, that's one of the things you and I both have said over the years, doctors come out and they want to, 
name their practice, you know, Joe Smith mm-hmm. MD or Smith plastic surgery. Um, right. And you, you know, they can't do that. You have to, um, for two different reasons, you need to have a name that's not affiliated with your name, your name um, yeah. one. So you can bring on an associate. Right. Um, and two, when you're ready to um, sell or retire, your URL is the most valuable thing and your mm-hmm. OR that you have in years past okay. doctors would sell their practices right. um, and you'd get their patients and there was value in that. There's not value in that anymore. No. Um, and that changed, no. you know, early on um, because patients now, if Dr. Smith is no longer there, they're going to go to their friend and say, well, who did you have your you know, breast surgery done by? Well, I went to Dr. Jones. Okay. Well, I'm going to go to Dr. Jones. Right. So, you know, that's something that, you know, again, if we're on our first of our series mm-hmm. of two, <laughs> making yeah. sure that when you're naming your practice, that it's not your name. I think that's a great point. And, and that will go into our second, where we can talk more about the marketing and Correct. branding of, because I think that's where you're, where really the value of a practice is. It's, it's the brand. It's becoming, it absolutely is. you know, it's the brand. And, you know, once it's tied to a particular individual or a face, Mm-hmm. or a name and that face and name is no longer part of the business, you know, that, you know, a large part of the quote brand goes away. Absolutely. Um, and then having so. the building, if you own your own building is owned by you, then you mm-hmm. have the, your office is one LLC, the non-surgical is another LLC. And then the OR is a different LLC. Right. Yeah. And that way, when you are bringing on new associates, you know, you're, they're just buying into the practice, practice not, not into another. the facility. Yes, exactly. Right. So Makes there's a lot of sense. That's a, another great, great pitfall <laughs> to make sure that you avoid. Correct. Um, well, super Sandy, l- let's do plan on uh, a second, second of the series where we yes. are going to go into kind of practice growth mode. Yes. Um, you know, even for these young practices, what can they do to start, you know, priming the pump? How, to, how can we start filling and getting, you know, schedules filled as well as referral uh, referrals, how to build those types of things. Uh, yeah. and then we can get into a lot more of what I would call the fun things for me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> things that we get excited about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that to me, that's the fun part, but, but yeah. there, there's no, no question that the foundation that you're building, uh, you know, marketing only works when you have a good product. Uh, and, and without those building blocks, um, you know, all the marketing in the world, will just be a, an expense, not Absolutely. a revenue stream. So Absolutely. super. Hey, Sandy, thank you again for all oh, your time today. You. We will, I'll be in touch. We'll schedule another one. But uh, as always, great insights. You know, I, I, I listen to you talk all the time. I still walked away with, with two, two pearls that I'm going to, I'm going to pocket today. (laughs) And likewise, I always love listening. Like I said, I think we equally learn so much from each other um, because it's all about learning. It's, you know, that's one of the things I feel makes me, you know, a better consultant is that I don't get stuck in my ways. I'm always, you know, looking to see what we can do different depending on technology and the environment. And you do the same. And I think that's why I always say we're we're the Uh, (laughs) A-team. We work well together. (laughs) Well, super, Sandy. You have a great day. Thank you. You uh, too. And we'll be on the next show together. Perfect. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thanks for joining us for the Med Shark Insider with Bill Fukui. Join us next week for another dive into all things medical marketing. All episodes can be streamed at www.medsharkdigital.com/slash medshark-insider.